So my fabulous guests, thanks a lot. Um, I want to start with uh, Sabine. She's an art historian. She's very good in structuring, categorizing. So I asked her, uh, her first task is to give us some kind of an introduction to this field. Uh, what is AI art? How can you categorize it from a historic point of view? So give us an introduction. And I think you have some slides, right? Uh, so yes, this is a presentation. My slides up, Sabine Himmelsbach. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for having me again, uh, Susanne. I make it short. I just wanted to show a few examples because we are speaking about AI, which is everywhere, you know, with, with prompting now available to the large public, but to, to draw our attention to history one more time. Uh, because I think since the advent of AI research, artists have, have been involved with it as well. And uh, first, two examples regarding machine vision. Uh, pioneering artist Harold Cohen and his Aron computer program, uh, which I think is one of the longest running AI programs. It was active from 1972 to 2016 uh, when uh, Cohen died. And you see here an uh, older example where the machine was only working in black and white and uh, uh, Cohen was coloring himself, and then later uh, examples where the machine was also using uh, color. If I can have this next slide. Also uh, pioneering artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson and her chatbot project Agent Ruby, an online project that people could engage with, of course, also in the tradition of uh, Weizenbaum's uh, ELISA project um, from the 60s. And, uh, because we have two artists uh, working with machine vision and robotics. Uh, my next slide, please, uh, is pioneer Edward Inatovic and the Senster project that he developed for the Evoluon Pavilion of Philips in Eindhoven, which was active from 1970 to 1974, so AI and robotics. And then I have no slide here, but... Uh, we heard about it yesterday in Krista Sommerer and Laurent Mia News Talk. Uh, artists also are working with artificial in uh, artificial life and simulation of life. The AWOLF project uh, was mentioned yesterday. Then uh, move forward to uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks, and the new hype uh, that we experienced a couple of years ago uh, with the auction of the already uh, mentioned work Portrait of El Edmond Bellamy by the French artist uh, collective Obvious, which was sold for 10 times more than, uh, than the uh, original quote, which was 432,000 uh, US dollars. And then, uh, of course, uh, there was a lot of work uh, produced with generative adversarial networks, and that was actually also the moment when we at HEK, House of Electronic Arts in Basel, did our show, Entangled Realities, Living with Artificial Intelligence in 2019, which was a moment where we wanted to showcase, kind of like to open the black box of AI, how are the inner workings and processes, and on the other hand, also, um, yeah, uh, showcasing how uh, how these systems are embedded in our technology, although people at that time were not so aware of, as is it now with, with prompting and text uh, to image uh, models and large language models, everybody is using the technology. So it was really kind of a precursor and we are actually planning another show uh, next year, which has a working title, Other Intelligences, which is really looking at AI on the one side, but then also on non-human intelligence as a counterpart to uh, what we understand as uh, intelligence, which is actually also something that we could discuss because scientists talk about machine learning and not uh, artificial intelligence. But here I have uh, the, the one, the one of the entry uh, works into the exhibition was, uh, sorry, I have a wrong title here, it's actually titled Uncanny Mirror by Mario Klingemann and maybe, I don't know if it's okay to hand over to Mario to 
speak about that work or yeah sure uh, and and maybe you you can also give some information i i hope you accept that we are starting with mario now because he's the older guy you know that's for sure <laughs> that's a good reason um i accept i accept thanks <laughs> So how did you get there? And uh, I mentioned before introducing you, you started much earlier. B uh, you are not a hype guy. You, you started with robotics and neural networks and all these things uh, before others uh, s knew about the existence of this. So please let us give okay. some background. How many minutes do I have? But yeah, so. <laughs> we are missing but, yeah. Simon. That means uh, yeah, okay, it's a, we have a bit more. Uh, spare time. Um, so yeah, I. I'm self-taught and I'm also kind of, as you said, like interested in a lot of things. I feel like uh, I'm a little bit uh, kind of uh, like Herbert in that sense that I, I'm interested in a lot of topics which for me tie together, but yes, that also involves robots and AI. Uh, maybe I start kind of 40 years ago, very quickly. I have to because that was my sure. moment of we, epiphany. We are, you know, okay. we are here in a his, in a historic um, exactly. environment, so yeah. you are free to start 40 years ago. So it's not so far, you no, know. No, no, exactly. But <laughs> I was a, a teenager and uh, had kind of my first Commodore C64, which was my third computer, and uh, learned kind of programming uh, and. I had that sudden insight that a digital bitmap is actually containing the entire knowledge about the world, everything that already we know and we will ever know, because in the end it's just about setting the right pixels, and I have ways theoretically to systematically find interesting things there. So yes, I, I wrote that, because yeah, it can show every image, it can show every text in a certain resolution, of course, but it, if I just find the right pixel combination, I get access to anything I ever want to know, every secret. So yeah, I wrote that program very s in a few hours, which would just start going through all the possibilities, and of course had to notice very quickly that the brute force approach would not work. Also, throwing a dice would not work, just like flipping some random pixels in the small bitmap, most of the time, as we know, we just get random noise. And that started my journey in realizing, okay, I have to find better ways to get the right pixels. It's like more of the signal, less of the noise, which brought me into generative art, where I wrote algorithms which, within a small subset of possibility space, generate something that is aesthetically pleasing, interesting, uh, something like that. But uh, so. It also got me thinking, how can I kind of get myself even more out of this equation? Because like, in the end, it was still me having to select the interesting from the non-interesting, which brings me to the pro problem, what is it that I find interesting? What is it that I uh, find aesthetic and not aesthetic? Can I measure that? And that was already the point where I said like, okay, how can I make a machine see like me or see like other people, learn kind of the rules? Because of course there are all the books, we learn what is good art, how to make art, so there must be certain rules. And, but I had also very kind of a rational approach to it, so it must be measurable, there must be some way of uh, going about. But that was still too early for AI, so I had to wait actually until, I mean, in the mid, t like 2010 to 8 to 10, I started building simple machine learning algorithms which would look at the outputs of my algorithms, try to learn something rudimentary about, is this at least somewhat better than noise? And uh, so, and I was, but of course I knew there was the AI coming, and so I was ready then when the deep learning phase started, uh, first with the classifiers, uh, which, well, you feed in an image, you get out something. So that was the start, and then of course, for me, Deep Dream uh, was the first time that uh, you could get images out. So instead of just kind of measuring something, you could turn the direction around, and then the GAN started. And yes, and then uh, of course, uh, all the interesting things that happened on between started, because then these, you have these models which have an inner life, like the latent spaces, and uh, that's when the whole kind of multi-dimensionality of these things opened up and gave me a full new way of thinking about art. And, and I totally missed out on the part now that I also realized on the way that, uh, well, actually, the value or the aesthetic of an artwork is totally not just measurable by the 
output itself. It's actually in the real world, uh, the, the least part that's important, it's actually a social, a social phenomenon. So it's another kind of system around the art and that got me interested in how does art work. And uh, yeah, and so let's get to Uncanny Mirror. So that is one of the pieces where, well, the way it works is you have a camera and a screen. The camera sees like you in front of the screen. It trains a model um, based like on what it sees and tries to, and then feeds it into another model which does a rough sketch of a human or a face and uses the other model that has been trained on the material of everybody standing in front of the mirror to recreate you. So while you are looking at it and it gives you kind of this very uncanny view of yourself, you are also training the model. So it's kind of stealing your soul maybe or, and of course it comes with all the kind of biases and uh, mistakes these models make, which I find, of course, the interesting part of it, like how kind of, what does bring AI actually to the process? And it's exactly these unpredictable things, the, that it, something that is not controlled by me, so, which is the fascinating part, mm -hmm. so I guess. So Sukwen, uh, he is very eloquent, we know that, of course, um, Mario. So Sukwen, uh, I think you will have some uh, response to that. Uh, what brings AI to what brings AI for you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, this is working. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> uh, what a question. Uh, I think I've been a fan uh, of Mario's work for so long. Uh, I think he was really one of the first um, that I saw that could understand um, sort of the the technique of graphical programming uh, in a way that was so artful, so sophisticated so conceptual, so I really appreciate being up on stage here uh, with him. As far as where uh, I came into this idea of AI, um, I, uh, I like to start off by saying that my mother was a computer programmer and my father is an opera singer, so if we think about uh, art and AI as uh, analogous to art and technology or art uh, and, or technology and music, I really grew up with that as a really grounding mechanism. Um, I think I got really interested in this idea of gestural extension. You see some of those extensions uh, evident in Harold Cohen's work uh, as well with Aaron, this idea that you can create uh, a sequence of uh, painting strokes to allow a machine to re-embody your painted work. So I was interested in that because I have a background as a violinist as well. So I always thought that in working with uh, computers and working with computational systems, a lot of my own embodied presence was really erased in that, in that uh, dialogue. I think, um, I think as, as I know there are many artists in this room, there's um, so much this desire to get outside yourself a little bit. Uh, and, I, and I think I definitely had that uh, too. It also coincided with uh, the phase of deep learning uh, that came out with uh, AlphaGo uh, and DeepMind. Uh, the story goes that uh, a software program written by the engineers at DeepMind, which was then required by Google, uh, beat this uh, YK, this Go player, uh, at this really sophisticated game, um, and that sort of signaled the coming dystopian kind of AI future. And in, even in his defeat, Lisa Dole talks about uh, how he saw the beauty of um, uh, human and machine, but also uh, the potential beauty of the non-human move. And I thought that was a really interesting approach to thinking about um, AI uh, as not just uh, a system of classifiers and a training of models, but a way to really uh, think about ourselves beyond the, the human. So I think that was my first, it, and then I translated that into a project called Doug. I've talked about Doug a lot. Uh, Drawing Operations Unit Generation 1, we're on our sixth generation now, um, where I've incorporated different aspects of my biofeedback, um, uh, crowd data, and uh, my own drawing archives to create a kind of uncanny uh, mirror as well, but a way to think about um, these systems in a more embodied way. Mm -hmm. We talked uh, a lot today already about this word autonomous system. So you also addressed uh, the system is out I want to go outside my own and so on. Is, is this something that the artists of today want to do by using a machine going outside their own 
uh, because I'm a bit, uh, um, well, what, what should I say, scared about that. Um, the human is a human and uh, should, should be happy in, inside uh, and uh, maybe reflect to something, but not move out of, of the own system, has the wish to move out, or is it, is it really this way? Mario. Want me? Well, I think it's a kind of a natural instinct. It's almost like uh, paternal feelings. So it's that's, like kind, a, of, uh, that's yeah. kind of how I see it. So <laughs> it's uh, more like, it, or kind of like creating a golem or seeing like, can, like what happens if, and in this case, can I create an entity which feels autonomous to me, which starts developing its own life and uh, ultimately is able to surprise me to well, maybe teach me something or, uh, pay for my retirement. <laughs> 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 no, but really, so for me, it's really this matter. It's like an experimentation curiosity thing why I like this. So, in, and I start with myself saying like, like, what is it called, the Theseus uh, ship, where you start replacing part by part, and eventually you have something new, which is not, contains any original part anymore, but it's, uh, it's, it's still something that lives or that operates. And so I guess I'm on that journey. So, not sure if that's where I mentioned Botto or if that is... Uh, Wait, are you Botto's dad? <laughs> I'm Botto's dad. Okay, yeah. So, I don't know. Should I go into we Botto now? We talk about Botto, but maybe I just want to yeah, know, yeah, exactly. Sabine, did you want to respond to something? Because you took the mic. You can yeah, do it. I, I wanted, <laughs> I don't know, I wanted to mention the Botto project because we were showing it also uh, last year. And it was interesting that we were, of, you know, dealing with a collective to decide what kind of... Uh, formally presentation the work would take on in, in the exhibition. But I mean, from the perspective, like since 2019, there was probably no show without any AI-based work in it. And, but everybody was seeing it as a collaborator, let's say, or as a complex tool to be used, but not as an autonomous tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mario, Botto is the subject <laughs> now. Did you have, I didn't want to steal the mic all the time. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> The, I think it's interesting because on one hand, um, I, I joke about asking whether Bato's your son or, or whatever, or you're the dad of Bato. Because I, I get asked a lot, am I the mother of robots? And I really, <laughs> let's, let's deal with that for a moment. But I think um, we're looking for new relational metaphors with technology. Um, I think obviously the uh, parental metaphor is one that's employed uh, there's a lot of different other types of uh, metaphors, like collaborator uh, is another one that we, we employ to try to wayfind our, our relationship to these systems. And I think part of what's interesting about what we do as artists is we can create new metaphors, and we don't need to rely on what came before. Um, that's kind of part of the, the practice, I think. Uh, so uh, I'm, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of new ways to think about intelligence, new ways to think about the human subject, the machine subject, in some of the slides that I guess we're not showing now. Um, I've been thinking about uh, this quote by... Do you... Oh, sorry, you have a presentation did, too. Yeah, we have to show them. Sorry for that. Oh, uh, we, we go for this presentation now and you can... Uh, yeah, keep no, on. It, it's, it's actually, I, I'm enjoying the conversation, so no, it, we no, need no, it, um, But you can show it a bit. Okay, great. Uh, there is a quote by Gilbert Simondon that talks about the robot um, as a space of imagination. One of the great myths of modernity is the robot metaphor, a machine that is untouchable and self-oriented. A robot does not exist. It is not a machine as much as a statue is not a living being, only a product of imagination, of fictive fabrication, and the art of illusion. So I think in that way, how uh, Mario and I employ robotics in our work is one that redefines these categories and that helps us think through um, these integrations with technology dif in, in, with technology in a different way. Um, all, uh, my work has uh, traipsed upon uh, almost a decade of research uh, as artifact, uh, research as performance, and has employed different technologies to try to interrogate uh, the human subject in the space of mark making, not eliminating the human hand, but really reframing it and uh, reconditioning it for uh, today's interesting age. I will leave with this um, slide, actually, because it's a much longer presentation, but I really like this slide because it always, I come back to it 
um, when I think about the relational potential of integrating with these and building uh, these new systems that um, always foreground uh, power, control, um, agency, autonomy um, in that system. So I think there's no one size fits all for how we work with AI or how we use NFTs or how we work with technology in general, but I think both of our work and a lot of the work of the uh, forthcoming presenters are really uh, pioneering new ways of engaging with uh, these really existential um, ideas. So. so Mario, now we come back to Botto. Please, uh, I think not yeah, I, I will All quickly explain what like the, the general no, idea, right? Have to, uh, you, need, you need to explain yeah. it, yes. Okay, so, so Botto is uh, me asking the question if it's possible to create a fully autonomous entity that gets seen as an artist, just like a human being would. So, and uh, Botto uh, consists out uh, of, well, I would also Botto call Botto something like an inverse cyborg. So it's not uh, humans augmented by machines or by AI, but rather the opposite way. It's an AI augmented by humans, which take over certain parts that at the moment are not uh, feasibly kind of without kind of pretend play. So like Botto is, supposed to work also it's not an uh, just an experiment that is supposed to be shown at one or two festivals because it's easy to build s autonomous things that only have to work for two weeks but it is actually it has to show. survive so on its as own a show, it should work in real life it, it works in real life so the way it works so of course uh, there were several components necessary ai the blockchain and uh, well let's say also DAOs maybe so it contains of three components, I would say. So there's the AI. I mean, everybody hates to put the before AI, but so, so there is the black box, which we could see as a very creative uh, savant that it's able to produce Something. art. <laughs> <laughs> Something that looks like art. Right now, it's images. And this thing can produce thousands of, we call fragments, every day, it works 24 hours, but it has no taste. It also has no idea how the art world works, and, uh, but it has to survive, and in that sense, it has to sell its art. Unfortunately, that's the, the reality also human artists face, right? Ideally, you would just do it for the art, but you have to survive because it has to pay its servers and uh, energy and uh, its human, some of its humans' assistance. So there is the DAO, which uh, everybody can join, and the DAO helps uh, kind of making like votes on the art Botto proposes every week. So, and then one, like every week Botto makes a curation of 350 new fragments that it shows to the human community. They vote on it. The winner of the week gets minted. And if the minted piece sells, 50% of the income gets distributed to everybody who helped the AI. So the DAO. The DAO. Participants. Uh, but it's a very individual because uh, the DAO is, of course, consists of individual people yeah, yeah. and you the have to work for it. You don't get it for free. You have to actually vote Click. work. Yeah. And the half of it goes to Botto to pay, keep on making it immortal. And uh, at the same time, there's the third element, which is the Botto coin, which I, I call it a trinity. So it's the DAO, the AI, and the coin. So the, the brain, the heart, and the blood, maybe. Ooh. Because <laughs> yes, definitely this thing has religious connotations. Because if you look in history, what are the entities that survived through millennia? It's religions, actually. And they work pretty much the same way. You have an invisible entity that you believe in, and that can move. Can, that can create wars and that can uh, tie together people. And uh, whilst Botto is not a religion, it borrows a lot from uh, the way religions work. It does, I also, like, in my initial concept, I said, yeah, Botto does not have a face. It will not speak because that is gimmick. So I could, of course, easy. You could create a face that talks and is funny, but that is, That's again, not, not for so. Botto does only express itself through its, uh, its work. And so, and then, yeah, this is the system and it, it operates. Botto has uh, kind of been selling, it's still selling every week, uh, even in a dire market, it, it sells. So, uh, which is of course uh, an important part for the art market. I think it's, I hate that it has to sell, but uh, so yeah, it has in the 
since 2021, it has sold for art for $3.4 million, and so it has made more money than I. I don't get any of that. I just am a DAO member. It's not that there's like secret 10% to me. So, so that's, that's, it is, that's important to me. Botto is kind of, uh, it, it is An a real thing. I don't, system. it's not puppet play, but yeah. of course it is a narrative. Yeah. So, and that's the fascinating thing. So is, there, is it possible to create an immortal narrative that actually makes changes on the world and makes changes to the people who are involved? Uh, one, one following question. You said immortal. Uh, really? That's the question, right? I mean, <laughs> what does it take? So that is the benefit AI has over humans and the big difference. AI cannot die. It cannot, like, you can turn it off and then you can just save it's it no a thousand work. years. Hmm? It cannot work, lo no, lo no longer work when the No, but the difference is if you turn a human off and you cannot <laughs> turn it back on again, you can't even, you can have children, but that information transfer from you to your children is always imperfect. If you have an AI, which is just a program, you can save, like, you just have to make sure that your hard drive on which the AI is, is safe, but then a thousand years later, you can, you can turn it on and it's exactly the same. Then you can make thousands of copies and all of them are identical and can, so it is, that's the difference and that's why it can be immortal as long as it has energy and people willing to keep the, the power Main running. Isn't there an energy yeah. crisis going on? <laughs> well, maybe the AI can find ways, but I mean, that's maybe. <laughs> so that's what, what it's all about. Like, uh, that's what we are. We convert sunlight into information. So that's what we humans do, and AI just improves the process. So you want to be it, immortal. So that's, I mean, that's your goal, or is it, is it, is well, it your I'm goal? I'm not immortal, I'm not Botto. Question? Botto <laughs> is, uh, is like an immort potentially immortal child, but like, I don't know, many artists like to uh, the idea that at least their work becomes immortal, right? So, yes. <laughs> you know, one, uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, I really love about conversing with you, Mario, about this, which we've done like at the pub and like over the years, is that I actually, I think we're really, we have very, very different views on the world. <laughs> I don't, uh, I feel like, yeah, I, I, I don't know about this idea of AI as immortal. I, I, I feel like AI, the AI system is dependent is, is actually more fragile than this uh, space of um, of kind of omnipotence and sovereignty that we give it. That's sort of another d conversation for another time. I think in, in my system with uh, drawing operations, unit generation, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, the role of anthropomorphization was really, really interesting for me when I first started because it allowed me to uh, really tie my curiosity about the system with an emotional engagement. I've since uh, walked away a little bit from that because I think it gets into all this messy territory about, I mean, son or religion or partner or daughter. And, and I like thinking about the reality of it as much more complex and much more ill-defined. Um, something that does evolve and change how we think about ourselves, but not something with its own like sentience or agency. Um, it's, I, I really love that kind of playful approach, but I think that can be a little bit uh, uh, mis misleading in, in some ways to really anthropomorphize the machine, uh, to think about AI as an AI versus a suite of technologies and systems that change how we behave in the world. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, but it's a really interesting topic. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sabine, what is your impression t talking them uh, arguing against or even <laughs> same direction, uh, are you lost? <laughs> no, not lost. As a museum, uh, I mean, of course, yeah. uh, as a museum uh, representative? I mean, we showcased uh, very different artworks, you know, using AI from anthropomorphization. Of course, the people relate to uh, human-looking robots. I find, for me, the discussion is more for a history, it always has been this talk of human against machine. And I think that's wrong, this dichotomy is wrong. It's kind of like, as far as I experience it, as a, as a very complex and potent tool that we need. I think that you know the world is, is now so complex that we need AI for a lot of um, things to run. It's more kind of human and AI. And like my last slide, when you saw the, the setup of the exhibition, Entangled Realities. 
we wanted to also use AI somehow in the exhibition, and I asked an artist group uh, from Switzerland, Fabric, to train an AI to do the exhibition design. Of course, I didn't trust it, and I thought like it would probably be a stupid design <laughs> coming up, and we trained it with the data that we have on the artworks and the seating and the wall systems and so on. And uh, something interesting happened because, of course, there is no agency, there is no understanding. It's just kind of like a da data aggregation. And the system came up with fragmented walls and everything was fragmented. But actually, that was super inspiring. So we did not build a show kind of based on what the AI suggested, but we did something that we would have never probably done uh, without seeing these images where they're like, wait a minute, what is that? You know, and then actually it was a very, very interesting design. So I think human and AI kind of like making the best of this uh, collaboration. That's what I see mm -hmm. the future. I think that's definitely something I've um, really brought into when I've thought about why, why performing the system uh, in public matters for me as a as an artist is that I think a lot of this idea of what you're saying Sabine um, this this idea of AI as creative catalyst something that can really push uh, myself to think and make creative decisions and adapt in ways that um, I wouldn't without this kind of this other um, in in my in my studio in the stage in the space of a performance I think that is the really fascinating thing that's uh, really electrified this decades-long um, process of work because there's always new aspects, there's always new types of data, always new frameworks to play with that can create those new inflection points for um, insight and, uh, and exploration. So that resonates a lot with the work as well. It's amazing. Time is almost over. I think Botto has the last oh. word. <laughs> Well, in, I agree with both of you here that, yes, of course, I mean, that's why AI is so addictive, because it uh, can always show you something you haven't seen yet, and, and, and yes, especially exactly with you in the middle, then uh, you can take this, you, you have to recognize it as something interesting, or, but yeah, uh, I believe that we cannot fully create something just our, out of our, ourselves. Even if you don't use computers, you take in inspirations and everything, and only the AI can make you make these decisions faster, which kind of becomes necessary because the space is getting so filled up and there are almost no more, it feels like there's almost no more kind of white areas on the map left. So, and yeah, with help of AI, you can still kind of hope within your lifetime to, to find a few of them, because if you, don't do that, you will just reinvent the wheel because you can't know everything. So that kind of thing about originality. Of course, you can always hope that there is a next generation who thinks that uh, Taylor Swift is the best and uh, in reality it's just a cover version. <laughs> I, I gotta, if, if you'll indulge me, even though we're a little bit sure. over time. Um, I saw uh, serendip uh, cybernetic serendipity being referenced uh, by Yaja Reithart, um yesterday so much, and I spoke at the revival in London a few months ago, and I loved it. Really interesting curation. Christian Paul, who is curating the Harold Cohen show uh, at, at Whitney right now. Um, one of the things that I said uh, that I still think about and that, I, that people br bring up to me a lot is that uh, artists are really good at breaking things, and I think when artists used AI, uh, one of the things that really draws me to this kind of work is the slippages, is the biases, is the errors. And if we're, uh, if we've heard a lot about AI and 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 feel like we're at a gr kind of groundswell of that topic, which I think sometimes we feel like, uh, I, I remind myself that we're we're as artists and and people in a cultural field really good at breaking um, these systems that we might uh, find limiting in any way. So thanks a lot. I think we have a lot to digest now. So we go out and have a coffee break. And uh, well, I hope to see you back again. Thank you.